the majority of people in this country are a lot more sensible than what you see in Washington. And the reason that Washington doesn't work well, in part, is because the loudest, shrillest voices, the least compromising, uh, the most powerful, or those with the most money, have the most influence. And the way Washington changes is when people vote. And the way we break the deadlock on this issue is when Congress does not have just a stranglehold on this debate, or, or excuse me, the NRA does not have a stranglehold on Congress in this debate, but it is balanced by a whole bunch of folks, gun owners, law enforcement, the majority of the American people, when their voices are heard, then things get done. The proposals that we put forward are a version, a lawful, uh, more narrow version, of what was proposed by Joe Manchin and Senator Toomey of Pennsylvania, a Republican and a Democrat, both of whom get straight A scores from the NRA. And somehow, after Newtown, that did not pass the Senate. The majority of senators wanted it, but 90% of Republicans voted against it. And I'll be honest with you, 90% of those senators didn't disagree with the proposal, but they were fearful that it was going to affect them during the election. So, so all I'm saying is, is that this debate will not change and get balanced out so that lawful gun owners and their Second Amendment rights are protected, but we're also creating a pathway towards a safer uh, set of communities. It's not going to change until those who are concerned about violence are not as focused and disciplined during election time as those who are. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to throw my shoulders uh, behind folks who want to actually solve problems instead of just uh, you know, getting a high score from uh, an interest group. We have, uh, we have time for one more question. Um, and we talked about Chicago a little bit. We haven't really heard from, from young people uh, tonight. No offense to those who have spoken. Um, <laughs> Because I'm in the same category as you all. <laughs> Sorry, Father. But um, there's a lot of kids. There's a lot of kids, as you know, growing up in Chicago, fearful of walking to school, fearful of coming home from school. Yeah. There's a lot of kids who have been killed on buses. Um, there's a lot of moms of kids who have been killed in the streets of Chicago. And I want you to meet Trey Bosley. He's 18 years old. He's a high school student whose brother Terrell was shot and killed nearly 10 years ago while he was helping a friend in a church parking lot. Terrell would have turned 28 years old on this Tuesday. What's your question, Trey? Um, yeah, as you said, I lost my brother uh, a few years ago, well, 10 years ago. And I've also lost a uh, countless amount of family members and friends to gun violence as well. And just speaking on growing up as a young black teen in Chicago, we are surrounded by not only just gun violence, but police brutality as well. Most of us aren't thinking of our life on a long-term scale. Most of us are either thinking day to day, hour to hour, for some even minute to minute. Uh, I want to thank you for your stand against gun violence for not only the victims of gun violence, but those on the verge of being victims of gun violence. And my question to you is, what is your advice to those you've growing up surrounded by poverty and gun violence? Well, uh, first of all, I couldn't be prouder of it, and I know uh, is that your mom next, next to you? I know she's proud of you right now. Uh, so good job, mom. Uh, you know, when I see you, uh, Terrell, I, I think about my own. Trey. Uh, excuse me, Trey. Uh, when, when I see you, I, I think about my own youth. Because uh, I wasn't that different from you. Uh, probably not as articulate and maybe more of a, uh, a goof off. But the main difference was I lived in a more forgiving environment. If I screwed up, I wasn't at risk of getting shot. Uh, I'd get a second chance. There were a bunch of folks who were looking out for me, and there weren't a lot of guns on the streets. And that's how all kids should be growing up, wherever they live. Uh, 
I mean, my main advice to you is to continue to be an outstanding role model for the young ones who are coming up behind you. Keep listening to your mom. Work hard and get an education. Uh, understand that high school and the, whatever peer pressure or restrictions you're under right now won't matter by the time you're uh, an, a, a, a full adult. And what matters is your future. Um, but what I also want to say to you is, is that uh, you're really important to the future of this country. And, and, and I think it is critical in this debate to understand that it's not just inner city kids who are at risk in these situations. Out of the 30,000 uh, deaths due to gun violence, about two thirds of them are actually suicides. Now, that's part of the reason why we are investing more heavily also in mental health under my proposal. But while the majority of victims of gun homicide are black or Hispanic, the overwhelming majority of suicides by young people are white. And those two are tragedies. Those two are preventable. I'm the father of two outstanding young women, but being teenagers is tough. And, you know, we have all remember, you know, the, the times where you get confused, you're angry, and then next thing you know, if you have access to a firearm, what kind of bad decisions you might make. So those are deaths we also want to prevent. Accidental shootings are also deaths we want to prevent. And we're not going to prevent all of them. But we can do better. We're not going to, through this initiative alone, solve all the problems of inner city crime. Some of that, as I said, has to do with investing in these communities and making sure there's good education and jobs and opportunity. And, and you know, great parents and moral responsibility and, and ethical behavior and instilling that in our kids. That's going to be important. So, so th this is not a a proposal to solve every problem. It's a modest way of us getting started on improving the prospects of young men and young women like you the same way we try to improve every other aspect of our lives. That's all it is. And if we get started, as I said before, it used to be people didn't wear seat belts, didn't have airbags. It takes 20, 30 years, but you look and you, then you realize all these amazing lives of young people like this who are contributing to our society because we came together in a practical way, looking at evidence, looking at data, and figured out how can we make that work better. Right now, Congress prohibits us even studying through the Center for Disease Control ways in which we could reduce gun violence. That's how crazy this thing has become. Let's at least figure out what works. And some of the proposals that I'm making may turn out are not as effective as others. But at least let's figure it out. Let's try some things. Let's not just assume that every few weeks there's a mass shooting <coughs> that gets publicity. Every few months there's one that gets national publicity. Every day there are a whole bunch of folks shot on st streets around the country that we don't even hear about. That is, that is not something that we can be satisfied with. And, and part of my faith and hope in America is just that, not, not that we achieve a perfect union, but that we get better. And we can do better than we're doing right now, if we come together. So, thank you. Mr. President, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate thank it very much. I want to thank everybody here who took part, everyone who made uh, this vital conversation possible, President Obama, all our guests, George Mason University, everyone. The conversation continues now with CNN's Jake Tapper. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Really an honor, sir. I wish you the best. Thank you. So you're a senior this year? Good evening. I'm Jake Tapper, and you just watched a remarkable event, a live town hall meeting with President Obama. He spoke with CNN's Anderson Cooper and real people 
from across the political spectrum about guns and gun violence and gun control. Let's talk about it. I'm joined here in Washington by an all-star group of CNN analysts and experts. You'll also hear reactions from the folks who spoke face-to-face -face, uh, with the president. Let's get some uh, initial reaction uh, from some of our commentators here. Hugh Hewitt, uh, you're a skeptic of President Obama, a skeptic of his proposals. What did you think? Did he convince anyone in that room if he didn't he, convince you. No, I'm very disappointed. It was a terrific setting. Anderson Cooper opened with a very tough set of questions about why do you talk about confiscation? Why do you talk about Australia? What's your trust deficit? Anderson closed with tough questions. He got tough questions from Kea. He got tough questions from Kimberly, from Sheriff Paul. He answered none of them. It's not a conspiracy to worry about this president's abuse of power. He put out an unconstitutional executive order about immigration. He unconstitutionally limited Hobby Lobby's rights. It is not a conspiracy to be concerned about where he's going and to mock, minimize, and to uh, denigrate the people whom you ought to be serving is deeply disappointing. We're watching President Obama as he goes around uh, the room there at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia, meeting with a lot of uh, supporters as well as skeptics. There were certainly a number of individuals in the room uh, who came armed with questions that were difficult for the president, people who were uh, gun owners. Uh, Jay Carney, uh, former White House press secretary, you worked for the president uh, during some very difficult times. Uh, I recall covering them, Aurora, the Navy Yard shooting, uh, and of course, uh, Newtown. Uh, I suspect that a lot of this you've heard from President Obama before, but he's certainly making an effort like we've never seen, seen before on this issue. Well, he is, and I, you know, Hugh, I'm, 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 I guess I'm disappointed that you view it that way because I thought the president, both his proposals and his demeanor tonight were pretty reasonable and pretty uh, open to uh, the fact that we are a nation with uh, a lot of different views on this issue. And... I, you know, the, the, his executive actions have sparked this conversation uh, in, in the wake of some more mass shootings, uh, but they are extremely modest, and, and maybe the courts will decide about their constitutionality, but they are very much on the margins of what can be done because the fact is uh, only Congress can take the necessary action to uh, make sure our background check system works efficiently and effectively across the country and that there aren't these giant, giant loopholes, and, and we, he tried that in the wake of Newtown. And what was talked about in the uh, event tonight where uh, senators who were discussing a bill to simply close gun uh, you know, background check loopholes uh, said it was a conspiracy that would lead to confiscation. That was an utter misrepresentation. And that was a law before Congress that if Congress had passed, it become the, would have become the law of the land. It was not about executive authority. Uh, unfortunately, though 90% of the country supported it, overwhelming majorities of Republicans and NRA members supported it. Uh, it did not uh, get the ne necessary votes in Congress. Essie Cup, you're not only a gun rights supporter, you're a gun owner. Well, what did you hear from the president today? Well, I mean, to, to, to echo Hugh, I, uh, I thought it was deeply divisive to divide people into two groups, and I'll quote him, those who are concerned about violence and those who aren't. I don't think you could find a gun owner in this country that is not concerned about gun, gun violence. And just because we don't want to support a slew of meaningless laws that won't make us any safer doesn't mean we don't care. I also think uh, his entire world philosophy, is, as we saw tonight, is really predicated on one uniting principle, that criminals are somehow going to submit to laws. And that requires a total suspension of disbelief. And a lot of the scenarios that he outlined tonight that he wants to prevent are scenarios that are already illegal. And he can't explain what new laws, what new legislation, new executive actions, expanded background checks are going to prevent any of these same crimes from being committed. Van, I suspect uh, you disagree with the SE Cup. You also worked for President Obama. Yeah, well, what did I, you think? I see it differently. And, and uh, first of all, um, I couldn't be prouder of this president. I just couldn't be proud of this president. I was proud of him uh, when he shed tears earlier uh, this week. He, sometimes he's speaking two millions of Americans. He was speaking four millions of Americans. Uh, who were heartbroken. I also felt like uh, if you were a Republican, at some point, can you take yes for an answer? Uh, the, the, before he even announced any of this stuff, there was a hue and a cry. You had conservatives out there saying this is going to be the gun-grabbing apocalypse. And then he comes out with this very modest stuff that absolutely is inside of what Republicans said. They said, don't make any new laws, and he didn't. They said, focus on mental health. He's asking for a half a billion dollars. They said, enforce existing laws. 
That's what he's asking for support to do. And so for me to sit here and to see this president, it takes character and it takes courage to sit there and have anybody throw any question at you. Some of them he, he answered well, some he answered poorly, but I'm proud of this president tonight. How about some new laws, though, Ben? How about some new laws, some minimum mandatory for criminals that use guns in a crime? Harry, just to introduce you to the audience, Harry, okay. former NYPD uh, detective, what exactly